So how's the uh, how's the tour going so far? It's been great. I mean, it's been uh, an interesting transition having been on hiatus for 18 months and then to come back. It's uh, it's an interesting experience just having been um, all of us on hiatus and um, all of us essentially home and doing whatever we could do and suddenly being on stage in front of audiences. And, you know, now we're in, in San Francisco, which is an overwhelming sensory experience. So I think we're all kind of... Um, uh, of taking stock now and and kind of surveying the uh, the experience of having been on ice for so long and now suddenly being thrust right into the middle of everything. So how long were you on tour before everything kind of got uh, shut down? So we we opened in December of 2019 and in in Washington DC and we ran through mid-March when we got shut down in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I'll never forget taking the, the plane back on my birthday, March 16th, back in, I was basically the only person on that plane. Everything was, as, as everybody can remember, everything was, was really fraught and nobody knew exactly what was going on. And, uh, and you know, it was a very, very strange, strange time. But yeah, so we were, we've been on hiatus since mid-March of 2020 until we geared up again uh, right after Labor Day of this year. Wow. I mean, that's got to be like, uh, were you just like itching to get back on stage? Or I mean, it, like your life was kind of like, I mean, not your life, but your professional life was just kind of on hold, I would feel like, right? Well, I was fortunate. I, I actually had other things that I was that I was able to do. So I have a, um, a home recording studio and I do audiobook narration. So I... I dusted off my recording studio and I began doing audiobooks again. I did a lot of, of um, I do corporate uh, training work also, and that it all moved to, digital, uh, to, to the uh, virtual space. And um, I also did a lot of virtual coaching. So, and, and I actually ended up booking a fair amount of film and TV work. So I was more fortunate than most. What I'll say is that um, I think a lot of us have sort of ambivalent feelings about returning to theater. I think we're, we're thrilled to be back and, you know, and, and doing what we love to do. And we're also realizing that it was not without uh, some casualties and having been in that experience. And I think all of us are, are still feeling a little, um, a little tentative, um, having all been, um, you know, through this whole experience, this collective experience, I think was traumatic in its own way as well. So I think a mixed bag, thrilled to be performing, thrilled to be doing what we do, what we do uh, that we love to do, thrilled to be in front of audiences, and also a little of what just happened and, and how are we moving forward? I know, uh, I read that you have actually played this role before. Yes, yes. So I, I played it before, well, first of all, I played it um, on Broadway. So I was in the, the, the Lincoln Center production and I understudied um, I'm sorry. Did I, did I just put it? Oh no! I I, I said uh, yeah. Oh okay. So um, originally, I, I I was in the the Lincoln Center production. I understudied uh, Norbert Leo Butts and uh, and Danny Burstein and Alexander Gemignani and and I, I got to go on a fair amount as Doolittle, and then. Um, but before that, I actually my that's my, what I was talking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My theatrical debut in some ways was doing My Fair Lady in a high school production when I was 15 years old. Um, the woman who did that, who directed that production, whose name is Jeremy Brown, who is now in her 80s and is still with us, was actually in the original production of My Fair Lady. So much of the staging that we did, she borrowed liberally from the original production of My Fair Lady. She sent me while I was doing it at Lincoln Center some, some production stills, well actually some candid shots, I should say, of her wearing her ensemble costumes. It was, and she, she took them all outside the stage doors of the, the various uh, you know, theaters because the, the theater, the show moved from theater to theater. Um, that was very common in those days. So there she is, you know, in these glam shots wearing the Ascot, you know, outfits and her maid's costumes. And it was, it was really delightful. Playing that role was really, I think, a, a, um, a real seminal moment for me. It was the first time that I actually got to play a leading part on, on the stage in front of people and it had an enormous impact on me. Uh, now, so uh, like you had said, you, uh, you were understudy for the role and you went on uh, several times for it. Um, uh, but now that you have the role sort of full time 
after watching uh, the original actor play it on Broadway for you know that that long, how, how have you been able to make him now your own? You know, I because I would assume that things that what the original actor did like sort of got into your psyche. You know, your, your, your you know your consciousness. It's it's really a great question. When 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 I did that production, you know, I've, I've understudied uh, many times, and. Um, as an understudy, you don't often get the benefit of working directly with the, with the director to get a sense of what the original intentions were. So um, you, you, you do borrow liberally from what you see on stage and also invest in the character what you feel would be appropriate for the character. But I used to always say when I would go on for Danny Burstein, thanks for letting me borrow, you know, thanks for letting me use this for a while, but always with the assumption, the understanding that I'd be giving the car keys back. The good news is doing the show uh, in, in, in this production, uh, Barchir, our director, has completely reconceptualized it for a different cast. So he, he was very, uh, he's, he's a very generous and very wise director and understands that there's no benefit to having actors slavishly do the, the, the exact tracks that other actors have played. So we treated it as if it was a new production. Um, we, we, we went through the whole process of restaging it, and it did have to be restaged because when we did it at Lincoln Center, uh, the Vivian Beaumont Theater is an enormous barn of a theater, and the audience is surrounded on three sides. Now that we're on the road, all the theaters are, we're performing in our proscenium arch theater, so everything has flattened out, so it means we have to completely restage what we're doing. Um, and even when we returned from our pandemic hiatus, we still came back and we revisited it and restaged something. So I, I really appreciate that, that Barchi really um, invests in his performers and invests in the people that he hires to do these shows and, and, and is trusting of the process enough to let them discover new things and for him to discover new things along the way. You've worked with uh, the director uh, before, prior to this show. Um, so there's got to be like a, a level of trust he has in you to, to keep on bringing you back. <laughs> I'd like to think so. And um, it's, it's a, a, a terrific um, uh, compliment to be part of the stable of Barchier actors, the people that he hires I've seen because I've worked with so many of them. I know um, are, are of, a, of, of tremendous caliber. So I'm I'm great I'm gratified to be to be part of his work, um, and he kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, reformatted the the character from what we've probably seen before. He's kind of like a a grittier Doolittle now. Is that what I what I read? I I, th I think so. Um, I think that there there is has been a temptation to kind of envision Doolittle as a as a lovable drunken lout, um, and. I think that what Bart has done in, in, in bringing the show back to its, its origins uh, to Alien is to see Doolittle less as, as kind of a, a comedic relief character and more as a, as, as a truth teller, as somebody who um, represents a, a, a sort of transgressive character. He, he kept, Bart kept referring in rehearsals, the character being like Jack Kerouac you know, somebody who was fighting against the system. Uh, in this case, in the show, in, in the case of My Fair Lady against Edwardian uh, England, and in particular what Doolittle calls uh, middle-class morality. Um, so everything that he does in showing up at Henry Higgins uh, parlor, filthy, smelly, um, reeking of alcohol and, and lecturing him and, um, and, and, and pickering his best friends, on what morality really is all about and who gets to decide what morality is, is a very transgressive, defiant act, um, which makes it all the more delicious in the second act when we do uh, get me to the church on time, when he's, when he's forced to kind of adopt those very middle-class values that he was deriding in all the first act. Do you have any um, pre-show rituals that you like absolutely have to do? <laughs> um, I don't do a, 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 any kind of warm up. I'll be honest. I know people do. The one thing that I do consistently is um, is I have a little Bluetooth speaker and I listen to uh, uh, on NPR on WNYC uh, the New Standard show, 
Um, lately, I've been addicted to listening to um, uh, Radio Deluxe with uh, with uh, John Pizzarelli and Jessica Malaski, and uh, it's it's absolutely wonderful. I love listening to old standards. You've been understudy on uh, uh, several Broadway shows. What is the craziest story you have where, like, uh, the stage manager called you up and said, "Hey, you're going on tonight." There's, there's no question. The craziest story is when I, the, the very first show I did with Bart Shear was doing Fiddler on the Roof. Um, I understudied Danny Burstein as Tevya, um, and I knew we were going into right after our tech period. We were going into a heavy performance schedule for the holidays, um, which was something like 15 shows in a row. The part of Tevya, for those who don't know, and most people probably do, it's, it's a gargantuan part, and. When that early period arrived, we had just been, we did not have time for any, any rehearsals, no understudy rehearsals, no put-ins, and Danny Burstein got sick, and I had to go on. And fortunately, I had prepared myself for that eventuality, because there are, there are horror shows, horror stories of people having been thrown on in those circumstances. So I didn't want to be one of those, uh, one, you know, one of those people who was, uh, uh, you know, a, a cautionary tale. <laughs> I went on on a Sunday afternoon for, for, for Tevya, fully prepared without any, anybody having known what I could do. And because I knew what I was doing, I got to be a hero. And that oh. was one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life. And um, I went on to do that part 42 times, but that first Holy. time was one I'll never forget. Wow, man, that's got to be such like a high leaving the theater. Like, oh my God, look what I just did! It 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 really was. It felt like the culmination of everything that I had 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 worked so hard to do. It was incredibly gratifying, and the people in the company were so supportive. And I just remember feeling like everything was swirling around me, like I was the eye of the hurricane, just calm and centered, and everything around me swirling around. But it was an extraordinary experience. Uh, you say uh, you do do. Uh, Lots of audio uh, books as well. Um, and I saw you did The Tender Bar. Yes. Yeah. Um, I saw that movie a couple weeks or no, last week, I think it was. And uh, since you did the, the, the audio book, and I assume you have some sort of now personal connection to it, I, I suppose. Like, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but do you th are you going to go into it thinking, uh, thinking like, what, what will you go into it thinking, you know? Like, oh, they changed this, they changed that, this is wrong, I felt this. It's interesting, it's just, it's, you know, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, it's been so long since I re recorded the book. I, I, it's probably been 15 years, or I, I don't know how, you know, it's that I don't remember all the details of it. Um, and, I, and I've recorded over 100 audiobooks. So not, not to disparage it, because I remember it being um, a, a wonderful experience. I actually received a, 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 um, an audiophile uh, earphone award for, for the recording. Um, I remember at the time recording it, feeling very connected to J.R. Moringer, even though we had never met. He was, we, we both went to Yale at the same time. Um, we grew up in very similar areas, both of us in suburbs outside of New York City. Um, so I felt a, a strong connection to him. Um, and I remember the book was was beautifully written and beautifully remembered. I'll, I'll be very curious. I actually auditioned uh, I, I, for, for a, a part in the movie, which of course I didn't get. But um, I, I am very much looking forward to seeing it and hopefully remembering much that I had forgot. <laughs> uh, and then the final question, um, what's been your worst audition? <laughs> My worst audition. Okay, so um, many, many years ago, I auditioned for um, a revival of Assassins. And I thought I, I was going in for the part of the, for the balladeer and I thought I'm gonna blow them away. And so I, I, I learned how to play the Ballad of Booth on the banjo. And I went and I brought in my banjo. I was dressed in overalls and, you know, in, you know, in a depression cap. And I sang, you know, why did you do it, Johnny? You know, playing on my banjo. And uh, at the end of it, I remember the, um, the director looked at me, looked down at my picture and resume, looked back at me and went, well, thank you. And that was it. And it was the most humiliating experience, having put myself out there and having it just kind of fall right on its face. I, I was pulling egg off myself and my banjo for a couple of weeks after that.
That's a great story. Um, hey, I'm looking forward. To, I'm going to see the show next week. I'm looking forward to seeing it. And um, uh, I think you're great. Thank you for taking the time to chat with me. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much. It was really great.